Hello, it's good to be here. So I guess you know this fairy tale of the little free piglets. Do you know it? Yeah, yeah I think everyone knows it. Uh, the first piglet was a bit lazy. It built its house out of straw. And so when the big bad wolf arrived, it immediately destroyed this house. And it was similar with the second piglet. It built its house out of wood, and so also here the big bad wolf immediately destroyed it. However, the third one was a bit more smart, and he put a lot of effort into his house. He built a house out of bricks, a solid brick house, and so the Big Bad Wolf was not capable of destroying this house. Everyone was safe, and we had a happy end. And this really shows that putting effort into something pays off, doesn't it? And this is such a nice metaphor, such a nice metaphor also for software architecture. So nice. And it's not only nice, it's also wrong. It's wrong. I'm very sorry. It's the wrong metaphor. Because if you come to the conclusion that all this means the more the better, then I'm very sorry. This is the wrong conclusion. Because if you ask me, then I need to tell you that my clicker does not work. So let me try something else. Hmm? Yeah, better. If you ask me, all of this is a spectrum. And on the one side of the spectrum, we have under-engineering, doing too little. On the other side, we have over-engineering, doing too much. And obviously, both is bad. I really know that both is bad because I tried it out. I did both. When I was a young engineer, we were in project business. We wanted to ship new features on a regular basis, so everything was under-engineered. And then we concentrated on software architecture, and suddenly everything was over-engineered, and really both is a mess. So if you ask me, the real goal is to find the sweet spot that is somewhere in the middle. And perhaps finding the sweet spot is more art than engineering. However, this is also what this talk is about. I want to show you how to better reach the sweet spot of all of this with your Angular architecture. And for this, I have prepared several things. We will get started with standalone components. We will proceed with custom standalone APIs. And then I'm talking about something I'm calling the simple Angular mosaic. But before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Manfred, I'm a trainer and consultant for Angular, and I'm focusing on Angular in the enterprise. I'm doing a lot of workshops and consultancy. I'm also quite connected to the Angular team. I live in Austria, I do a lot of stuff in Germany, and I'm always happy to work together with people around the globe. Okay, let's get started with the first part, which is about standalone components. As we all know, originally we had those two module systems. And this was kind of annoying, and that's why I guess all of us are really happy that since about a year we have standalone components. They can completely live without Angie modules, just put standalone to true, import everything you need in your template, and pops your uncle. And now, while this is quite simple, one big question arises, namely, what does this mean for my architecture? What does this mean for my architecture? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> it really means nothing for your architecture. You can totally stick with best practices, like structuring the application according to features. Of course, NG modules are gone, but besides this, you can stick with the same best practices. Or you could even go one step further and structure a huge application according to business domains. 
A business domain in that sense is an area of the real world you are writing your software for, and all those areas should not know much about each other because you want them to be evolvable separately. You want to change something here without breaking something there. And that's why it's quite usual to restrict the access between those domains. Here in this case, I might say, well, this boarding domain is not allowed to talk to the check-in domain or to luggage or to ticketing. It might talk to the shared stuff of our system, but nothing else. And defining those restrictions is fine. However, you need to enforce them somehow. And for this, you could go with tools like NX. NX provides you with a lot of tools for enterprise scale software, and linting rules for enforcing access restrictions is one example of them. In this case, you can do access restriction on a per library basis. That means you have to split the whole application into several libraries, and then you can define which library is allowed to access what further libraries. If you want to have it a bit more fine-grained, you could use the Sheriff. You know, there is a new Sheriff in town. It was implemented by my nice colleague Rainer Hanekamp, and it allows you to do the same on a per folder basis. That means you just split your application into several subfolders, you define access restrictions with the sheriff, and everything is fine. So let me show you all of this in action. Here I have a simple example. Here I have my domains folder. Look here, domains, check-in and ticketing. Here I have a shared folder. And if we look into this ticketing folder, we see this feature here which uh, is about searching for flights. And here I'm trying to grab over into another domain, into my check-in domain, and this is not allowed. Oh, it's, it's not sharing. Oh, what a pity. <laughs> so one more time, here we have the domains. And here I'm trying to grab over from a ticketing domain into the check-in domain. And you see the sheriff is telling me, hey, Manfred, what do you think you are doing? It's not allowed that you access this part. If we look to the error message, it says, you don't have any clearance for this very domain. And this makes sure that we don't get any broken windows. Everyone needs to align with our architecture. We can even run this check when someone wants to check in source code. And if the source code does not align with our rules, we don't allow to merge it. OK. The second thing I want to talk about is custom standalone APIs. I'm quite sure you have seen those standalone APIs the HTTP client comes with or the router comes with. You can use them to set up those libraries. You can pass in configuration objects and you can also activate optional features. For this, you have those with functions, with interceptors, with preloading, and so on. The interesting aspect of this from an architectural perspective is that we have a piece of code, a library, that is decoupled from our code. It can evolve separately. However, we can use it, and we can tweak it using well-defined tweak points. For instance, by adding some optional features or a configuration object. And now the question is, why not do the same with our own libraries? To demonstrate this, here I have a locker library. However, when I'm saying library, I don't necessarily mean an NBM package or a technical library. It could also be a part of your system that should be decoupled and tweaked in a well-defined way. My locker here gets a locker config and I have this with color feature. It's an optional feature allowing us to print out locking messages with different colors like error messages in red and debug messages in gray and so on and so forth. Before I show you how to implement something like this, let me also talk about what I'm calling the golden rule of services. Whenever possible, use provided in root. 
because it's the simplest way to provide a service and in, let's say, 90% of the use cases, it's good enough. However, if you want to pass in a configuration, if you want to activate an optional feature, you need something like this. So how does this look like? Well, first of all, you need a function. This function takes a configuration. It might also be a partial configuration, and it returns in the first version of this here a providers array. And in there, you set up all your services you need. Those could be services you need all the times, like my Locker service, or services you want to derive from the configuration, like the configuration itself, or here I'm providing a lock format or formatting my lock messages. The configuration allows us to tweak this logic. And that's all more or less. However, there is one drawback, namely this here, the provider array. The thing is, you have seen this, I'm quite sure, you can register a provider array inside of a component. However, most libraries are not intended to be registered inside of a component. Think about the router, it's intended to live outside of components. And to prevent the usage of this inside of components, the Angular team gave us this type here, environment providers. It's more or less a wrapper around a provider's array. You can create it with a function with this make environment providers function, and that's it. This already prevents that you can misuse the provider's array within a component. And if we talk about optional features, you might just add a rest array with some feature object. Here I have the type locker feature describing all my optional features and such an object can have many properties. The most important one is this here, another providers array. Providers we want to activate when we want to go with this optional feature. And that's it. This allows you to decouple your source code and to define well-defined points to tweak it. Awesome. Yeah, let me show you a demonstration for this. Oh, yeah, looks good this time. So what I have here is provide HTTP client, provide router, seems like I'm in good company. I'm going with provide locker. And if I want to use the locker as is, I could totally use it that way. In this case, it's a black box for me. I use it as it is shipped by default. However, if I want to tweak it, I can use this partial uh, configuration. I can uh, pass in a lock level. I can say, well, hey, I'm not interested in the debug messages and information messages. I'm only interested in the error messages. Please don't burden me with ordinary messages. And if I want to activate a feature, I just need to pass in the result of this with color function, providing us an object with a provider's array with all the services we need for this feature. Awesome, let's come to the third thing I've prepared for you. I'm calling it the single angular mosaic. The thing is, in recent versions, Angular got a lot of nice features. Some of them are really tiny, but they are nice. And if we look at them in isolation, I would say, yeah, they are nice, but they are nothing I would call home about. However, if we look at them as a set of features we are constantly using, then we find out this allows us to use Angular in a fresher, more modern, more lightweight way. And that's why I'm using this metaphor of the mosaic. And of course, there are several features and there is not enough time. That's why I'm doing a speed run here with all those features. And trust me, doing a speed run means a lot because I'm normally not the person who runs. <laughs> when it comes to this, I'm very British. You know what the British are saying? They say, a gentleman does not run. And I really like this. But just for you, <laughs> just for you, I have a speed run. So let's get started. 
Ah, cool. So this here is all you need to get your routing parameters in the future. You don't need more. Do we hear the music? Yeah. This is all you need for routing parameters. Just activate this optional feature and you can use routing parameters just by declaring inputs. The second thing I want to show you is that now for lazy loading, you can directly point to a lazy routing configuration. No need to do a detour via any NG module. Plus, you don't need the stand class. If you export your routing configuration as a default export, leave it away. I really love this because I always forget about the TAN class. Another thing is, and I think it was already mentioned in the keynote, guards are now functional. They are just functions. In the best case, they are a one-liner. In former days, you needed a service implementing an interface, forcing you into implement a method, and all of this needed to be registered here. Now just go with a function and pops your uncle. The same is true for resolvers. The same is true for interceptors. They are just functions nowadays. And you can register them with an optional feature. So this is where we go full cycle here. A last thing is we have signals and we have already seen today by definition, by design, signals can be used everywhere. They can really be used everywhere. They are not bound to a component. Feel free to move them into a service to do reactive state management. You might want to decide or to distinguish between your internal private read-write representation and the public read-only representation. And one last thing, there are a lot of emotions in there, but I show it to you either way. You can go with async await. If you don't need the power of promises, just go with async and await. It's simple and it works also in other communities, so why not in the Angular community too? For sure, this allows you to better meet the sweet spot of your architecture. Okay, that was the speed run. I'm really exhausted now, but let me, <laughs> let me come to a conclusion. What did we see today? We saw that modern Angular is all about lightweight architectures, which means you can easier reach the sweet spot between over and under engineering. And this all is about standalone components, the share ref, standalone APIs, it's about the simple Angular mosaic, it's about signal-based state management, and much more. And there is one last thing I really wanted to remember. Do not believe every fairy tale. So thanks for having me. Here you have my contact data. I've already uploaded my material to my blog and follow me on Twitter to stay in contact. Thank you.